what the covert narcissist owes the target. It was a brisk early November morning, evidence of autumn in the first cold temperatures of the fall, in the leaves, in the fragrance of the air. Jennifer had to bundle up for that morning coffee outside in the sun. But there might soon be an end to that ritual she so enjoyed during the summer months. That wasn't the case five years ago, and for a brief moment she recalls what things were like five years ago to the day, when she went out into that cold November morning, and continued to do so well into December, bundled up, outside, with her coffee, staring into space. Nothing going on inside her mind, no thoughts, just emptiness with no activity, and all that she felt at that time was intense anxiety, a sense of foreboding. That was no longer the case now. She was a human being again. She had hope. She regained faith in herself and in others. She could honestly tell herself that she was free of any toxic emotions and was at peace. Some truths remain unchanged regardless of the details that end up being perceived by the outside world. A covert narcissist is a covert narcissist is a covert narcissist. They are what they are, although they will be perceived differently by the different people they come in contact with over the course of their lives. Targets of covert narcissist abuse range from the hapless dupes that have a brief encounter with one of these creeps and are totally unaware of the danger they were in, to people who have their whole lives turned upside down. Luckily for the first group of prospective targets the narc saw another target they held in higher esteem or was a more convenient or easier catch, so the narc passed over the original intended recipient of the treatment. Other times the narc assesses the vulnerabilities of a target and begins playing their game and is shocked to find out that the intended target, who is skeptical of the mirroring and definitely never took the flattery seriously, refuses to go the next step and become the narc's Aunt Sally or punching bag. Yes some targets saw many of the narc's foibles a mile away but still entered a relationship with the narc because they saw the disingenuousness of the narc as cute or harmless. These targets weren't naive though and there was no way on earth they were going to allow manipulation or denigration. So these people got out of the relationship before the narc could do any major harm. Or the narc left for greener pastures, often in the most inexplicable and bizarre ways, leaving the target puzzled but nonetheless unharmed at the conclusion of a relationship that they never allowed themselves to be fully vulnerable in. So what about the targets the narc does eventually end up entrapping? An outsider might say these targets had a lack of vigilance and some might insinuate that the target was actually attracted to a person who would eventually denigrate and use them. But it's a vast oversimplification and somewhat unfair to chalk up a target that was duped by a covert narcissist as simply naive, a daydream believer, or a sucker. These targets may have been uninformed about the concept of covert narcissism and they may have had a misguided belief that there was good in all people, but that doesn't mean they were taken in by a fraudulent offer of a relationship that was too good to be true and were therefore too foolish to spot the fraud. These targets may well have understood the flawed nature of the covert narcissist and their propensity to bend the truth, but they took into account all of those things and gave that narc the benefit of the doubt and believed that deep inside that narc there was a good person who had gotten some bad breaks in life. In retrospect it is clear those targets who believed in the good of the narc made an error in judgment, but that should be considered a forgivable mistake. Yes, those uninformed people with all of the best intentions never took into account the possibility or even existence of covert narcissism and because of this ended up being suckered into the narc's web of deceit. So let's give the target a break and realize that some targets weren't looking for trouble, it was trouble that came looking for them. Regardless of all of that, it is these targets, the ones who were sucked into the narc's deceit and then held on despite all of the adversity, that end up having actual real and even life-changing if not life-ending consequences from an interaction with a covert narcissist. Yes, the narc's dark magic had different and varying effects on the people who surrounded them and there may well have been some people associated with the narc who saw that narc as a positive force, an asset, even someone that they were lucky to have spent time with. But let's be clear, a true covert narcissist is a person who has done grave harm to many people over the course of their lives and despite the obvious damage done, never lost a night's sleep over the pain and suffering they caused. 
The very fact that the narc is a serial offender proves that they never took any responsibility for any of their past treacherous actions or ever intended to improve themselves and stop hurting others. The sick fact is that the narc cherishes their wins when they placed past targets in impossible situations and looks back on the way they pulled off their deceptions with a sense of pride. So there is a very distinct underlying theme to a covert narcissist's life, an underlying attitude that follows the narc wherever they go. It is an attitude of putting on an act, pretending to be someone and something that they are not and convincing others that the act they are putting on is not an act at all. The narc gets a thrill and excitement out of walking into a new work environment and taking on the persona of a diligent, conscientious worker. The narc meets a new prospective partner, sizes them up, and pulls from the wide array of past experiences which run the gamut from movies watched to every person they ever came in contact with to come up with a persona that will suit their purpose of making a target believe that they, the narc, are the person that target has waited a lifetime to meet. Yes, that underlying attitude of the narc is one of evil disrespect of people, of wanton hatred and disapproval of anyone who has a clear conscience and an ability to feel love and compassion and to care. The narc feels no love, they don't care, they have no compassion, so the only satisfaction the narc will ever get is when they take away another person's ability to love, another person's ability to care, another person's ability to have empathy. For better or for worse, the narc's malevolence is usually reserved only for those closest to the narcopath, in the narc's private and personal world, and that is where they do their greatest damage, to the people closest to them. Yes, the public will see only a person who portrays themselves as being a benign, gracious, and even benevolent person. Surface appearance is all the vast majority of people will ever look at or see in an acquaintance or coworker, and the narc is fully aware of this fact. It is amazing how people will be taken in by the flimsiest presentations of a fake persona and believe the lie. The narc stories hardly ever match up. For example, in conversations a narc will be a person with one sibling one month and have three siblings they grew up with in next month's conversation and somehow people never even notice the discrepancies. Only a few people will eventually catch on to a narc and once they become aware of the narc's lies the narc is easily seen for the fraud that they are. But those brief interactions with co-workers and acquaintances aren't where the narc's evil ways find their full expression. Only the people the narc pretends to love, only those who have fully invested themselves into a covert narcissist get the full benefit of seeing what the evil side of a covert narcissist is all about. Even the briefest study of covert narcissism shows that aside from the false persona the narc likes to bandy about with, these narcs in essence are liars through and through, intensely selfish, and as callous a human being as you will ever come across. These narcs have no loyalty to anyone and once the honeymoon phase is over and the narc gets comfortable with the relationship boredom and infidelity, physical or mental, is right around the corner. It is only a matter of the narc getting an opportunity to cheat. A narc in any relationship that has actually gotten to the commitment phase has already started positioning themselves in their mind as a victim, as someone stuck in a relationship, as someone in need of a savior otherwise known as a new and different relationship. Money will make a difference and a narc living in luxury will certainly recognize where their bread is buttered and keep up a pretense of being in love for years on end but those secret desires will take up plenty of real estate in even the most comfortable narc's mind and oftentimes translate into real and actual infidelity. These demonic creeps have such a twisted sense of right and wrong that even the most wicked act of treachery on their part is always justified in their mind, and because of this their capacity to do damage to those who love them and have unwittingly committed themselves to a narc has almost no boundaries. Under the right circumstances a person who has committed to a relationship with a covert narcissist will have major damage done to their lives. Sadly, these people are totally unaware of the danger they are in. The selfish narc lives in a world of one, a world where other people's feelings or what happens to those people is of absolutely no consequence. Sadly, other people refers to the partners they purportedly loved until a better opportunity presented itself. 
Yes, at the flick of a switch a partner of years and decades becomes a stranger, and if that partner seeks an explanation as to what went wrong or why the narc left they will get every false accusation imaginable thrown at them. Of course the mere act of actually wanting to know what the narc was up to when they were in a relationship qualifies as an act of aggression by a previous partner. Let's illustrate the matter with a fictitious account and use some metaphoric hyperbole to emphasize the point. A couple is married for 10 years and has two children. The husband is a businessman and has in the past year talked about expanding the business and this requires him to stay at the office late two or three nights a week. The wife has suspicions after this goes on for three or four months with no actual evidence of any changes in the business. The wife has her mother stay with the children one night and stops by the office to check in on her husband and finds the doors locked and the lights on in the office. Her husband's car is in the lot so that is all she really wanted to know. The late nights seem to be getting later as the months roll by and her husband insists he is about to unveil some major improvements in the business. He needs to concentrate and that totally explains why he doesn't answer the texts his wife sends him. In fact, she is told not to contact him unless there is an emergency. Strangely though the husband is getting more and more emotionally distant and then a neighbor of hers drops a bombshell, her husband was seen out with another woman. Well there is no easy way to do it, but the wife asks her husband about the situation and adds to this the fact that she did check up on him a few months ago by going by the office. Well at this point the husband becomes irate and begins ranting about the wife not trusting him and smothering him and that behavior is making it very difficult for him to accomplish his business goals. As for the woman how dare the wife accuse him of anything untoward. That woman was helping him with the expansion. But then the wife makes a big mistake and actually wants some details, greater details of what is actually going on with this expansion and wants more information on this woman who is helping with the business. At this point the husband goes through the roof and says he needs some time for himself and that he can't live with someone who doesn't trust him. Well two months later the husband announces he is looking to formally separate and planning on a divorce and he really has nothing more to say to his former wife. The children will be taken care of and reasonable arrangements will be made for visitation. That's it. Well actually no, that isn't it for the wife. She wants to know what she did wrong. She wants to know what was really going on those late nights the husband was away at night. She wants to know about this woman and if he is with that woman he was seen with months previous and she is summarily told it is none of her business, she has no right to invade his privacy. Well the wife feels she has the right to an explanation, but she is told to no longer call her husband. She is told she has no right to know where her husband is staying. She is told it isn't any of her business what the husband does with his private life. Well the wife tells a few mutual friends about the situation and makes the comment that she suspects her husband of being with another woman. This gets back to the husband and he comes to the house and threatens his wife's life. How dare she publicly shame him and attack his reputation. Since she needs to know, yes he is now in a relationship with that woman but that is only because of the wife's poor behavior and disloyalty. She didn't trust her husband and her scrutiny of him was tantamount to abuse. Well now he had a woman who understood him and was an asset, a person who supported him and made it possible to achieve the success that he always wanted at his business. Yes, the former wife was holding that husband down. Well, that was already plenty to absorb, but then the real abuse began and the other woman had the audacity to confront the wife and tell her what an evil person she was and how she had been abusing her husband throughout the duration of the marriage. Yes, she was with this woman's husband and they were in love. So let's leave the story for a few moments and summarize. Those are the raw facts of this fictitious account so far. It's a painful account but many of the details are missing. That wife loved her husband. She believed in him and supported him. She had that man's children and was an exemplary mother and supportive wife. She gave up her career to support that husband of hers and now she is reduced to being portrayed as a witch who brought her husband down. She is the one with the self-doubts, the self-blame. She does some soul-searching and asks herself, 
Was she holding her husband down? Was she being abusive? She is the one beating herself up and questioning if she could have done better. The man she loved is now with another woman and aside from feeling worthless and unwanted that ex-wife is questioning the whole of her existence that past decade with her husband. But if all of that isn't enough she is given the heads up about the goings on on social media and when she views the pages showing her husband and this new woman it nearly breaks her into a million pieces. But she holds it together. Barely. For the children. Yes it's the holidays, and the fawning of these two together leaves this poor woman contemplating the pros and cons of living. She thinks of the future her and her husband had planned and can't believe that future will now belong to someone else. Aside from the absolute minimal contact required due to the children and legal matters, she has no way of contacting that husband of hers, but one day when he comes for the children she asks how could you do this to me? Well her husband says he has moved on and she should move on, as well. Mind you a mere four months previous that self-same husband was telling his wife how much he loved her. By the way, she had a year to move out of the house, and the husband would be more than happy to take full custody of the children. Okay then. That wife has been put into a deep hole. An emotional hole. A psychological hole. A soon-to-be approaching financial hole. The husband moved on, he survived that wife's abuse, and now he finally has a chance to be the person he always wanted to be and achieve the things he always wanted to achieve. Yes, that husband would finally realize his full potential. He moved on. He got on a plane and he took no one's baggage with him. Great. Good for him. The wife? Well, she needs to move on. According to the husband and the new woman, the previous wife deserves everything coming to her and more. Just like the husband and the new woman, deserve everything that has happened to them. Okay. Do you think this man might be a covert narcissist? Well that woman doesn't even know what covert narcissism is and left to herself she quickly begins to understand the reality of what just happened to her. She does her research and begins to get the answers and begins to understand that she just became the victim of a major gaslighting campaign complete with a female flying monkey weasel. It takes time for that former wife to realize that the smear campaign against her was projection and that everything she was accused of was actually perpetrated by her husband. The facts are clear, her husband grew tired of the marriage had an affair with a woman and made every excuse under the sun how that new relationship was the result of the wife's so-called wrongdoing. That man never took responsibility, never admitted any wrongdoing, and in the early stages, when the wife had the audacity to complain that she suspected philandering it was the philanderer who felt he was being wronged. Yes, out a covert narcissist in even the most innocent way for all of the right reasons and the narc will consider it the greatest wrong a person could ever do. An act worthy of total destruction or even death. Never mind the philandering and the betrayal of the marriage vows. That is minor according to the narc, since the narc is the one who did it and what the narc does is always justified. So there we have it, a thumbnail sketch of a narc's twisted logic and twisted contorted sense of right and wrong. According to the narc, justice has been served and everything is as it should be. The covert narcissist takes a wrecking ball to their previous partner's life and converts it to rubble and their opinion of the situation is that justice has been served. Well that's soon to be ex-wife and most sane people on this planet who won't believe the narc's lies will be of a different opinion. That poor ex-wife has quite a journey in front of her and being that she is a woman with the ability to feel love, as well as the pain of losing something she invested over a decade of her life into she can be forgiven for harboring deep animosity and anger. She can be forgiven for wanting to see genuine, justice served. She can be forgiven for wanting to seek vengeance. Is this woman going to be moving on anytime soon? That is absolutely ridiculous. Of course not. This person is in the psychological equivalent of an ICU. She can barely function. She is contemplating her next breath. 
Moving on is for the emotionally, the psychologically able-bodied and it might well be many years for her to reach that level. The husband. Well he has proven himself to have never loved or cared about or respected that wife of his ever. That callous, self-centered, selfish creep couldn't just have an affair, admit to it and give his wife a chance to get her life back together. No, he couldn't do that. It would have required actually caring about his wife and that is too much to expect, from a narc. So much easier for the narc to lie to everyone, admit no guilt, and play the role of victim when the raw facts, facts that will oftentimes never be known to outsiders, point to a very different conclusion. How the covert narcissist uses unwritten and written social contracts. Let's be clear, the covert narcissist doesn't always come out of each relationship fresh as a daisy or free and clear. Targets don't always behave according to the narc's plans, so there is always the possibility of the narc sometimes suffering damage themselves. Yes, the philandering husband above had all of the bases covered with his wife, but never took into account being seen by a neighbor with the other woman in one of those out-of-the-way places. Similarly, the philandering could have become common knowledge at the workplace as well, despite the discreet nature of the philandering couple's indiscretions. But the narc limits any damage to themselves simply by sticking to a false narrative that he has been giving voice to for years about a wife that doesn't understand him, is it which is holding him down, is preventing him from achieving his full potential. These false representations of his wife at home serve two purposes. First, it is a way for him to lure in prospective new love interests by subconsciously signaling the need for a new relationship with someone who does understand him. Secondly, it gives the narc time to solidify and make fully believable the lying false narrative he will one day use to create an alternate reality of what his marriage was all about. Yes, the narc may make many mistakes, but that false narrative is a safety net for him that doesn't have to be created on the fly. As for the philandering, the married narc gives himself many additional benefits by using his marriage status as a way to have flings that are purely physical with no commitment expected or implied, since he is purportedly committed to the wife at home. So the narcopathic creep plays the field freely and when he eventually does end up with someone who might be a keeper, otherwise known as an uncommitted relationship that he wants to convert to a prospective long-term partnership, he begins changing strategy. All of the sudden this covert creep will go to the next level and turn that prospective long-term replacement for his wife into a confidant. Yes, the narcopath will do more than discuss how his wife is keeping him down, he will begin slowly but surely making up a largely false narrative that includes all of the most intimate details of a couple's life and of course he will take special interest in those same details of the new prospective long-term partner's life. Yes, the cheating covert creep described above who suddenly dumped his wife did have a plan, a, that would have included creating the narrative of a long-term mental, emotional, and then eventually physical separation where the couple grew apart. Of course this, growing apart, and the narrative of the married couple discovering they had nothing in common would also be a purely fake construction by the narcopath and almost exclusively instigated by the narc. Yes, for those familiar with covert narcissism, this is called the devaluation phase that will inevitably be followed by the discard phase. But the married narc with children will do his best to keep up the appearances of devotion to their own spouse and certainly want to make sure the children the couple shares sees him as a noble, kind and even empathetic person. But out of the sight and earshot of the general public and the children, a different personality displays itself and the married narc will have no mercy whatsoever denigrating his wife in private. That denigration makes the narc feel like he has power over another person and does have value to the narc in and of itself, but the real pleasure that incredibly selfish creep gets out of the abuse of his wife is that he sees it as a very necessary and important process for him to achieve his goal of liberation and freedom with a new idealized relationship. Yes, that narc already mentally leaves an existing relationship and moves on to a new relationship even before they instigate their wicked plan of destroying that existing relationship and discarding an existing partner they entered into a social contract with. To put it another way, if that soon-to-be-discarded person does object to the bad treatment so be it, 
that will then be the reason, the foundation for a mutually agreed upon separation. In reality the narc saw an opportunity with someone else and slowly but subtly created the narrative of the couple not being able to see things each other's way within the relationship itself. So the game playing begins in earnest and for the first time ever his wife is told she doesn't understand him as well as he himself not being able to see things her way. This is of course the same false narrative the narc had been using for years outside of the presence of his wife. What a stark contrast to that narc privately calling his wife a soul mate, the woman he had been waiting for his whole life, just years previous. Yes, that disclosure to the wife that she was a nagging hag was only new to the wife since the husband was imminently planning his departure and in reality had already moved on and was now in the process of cleaning house, otherwise known as getting rid of the problem of his marriage. Yes, no one would suspect a thing if things went as planned for the narcopath, not family members, not the children, and perhaps not even the spouse who was being prepared for the discard herself. The narrative on display for the friends and relatives was dictated by the narc publicly stating full support of the marriage, publicly appearing fully committed to a marriage with problems and publicly giving the impression that he is trying to make things work out, while at the same time privately doing everything possible to alienate his wife and submarine the marriage. If the narc got it all his way the separation and eventual divorce would be amicable and mutually agreed upon. Magically, months later after having suffered the heartbreak of losing his wife, the narc would, reluctantly, have a new partner since he was not a person meant to be alone. Yes, the illicit relationship he had that had been totally hidden from everyone would now be laundered and converted from the cause of the breakup to the result of the breakup. Neat and cleaned for the narc. Yes, if the wife had objections to the husband having a new partner, so rapidly no one would be blaming the former husband for a thing. It would be the wife who confirmed to the world every bad thing the husband said about her in public for all of those years. Well unfortunately the philandering narcopath was found out and called out by his wife, so Plan B was instituted and this Plan B would include the total and utter destruction of the wife with no mercy. The scenario described above. Yes, the above account refers to a couple that got married and formally made a commitment to each other. A written social contract, so to speak. A pledge to love and honor each other in sickness and in health, in good and bad times. A pledge to love each other until death do them part. Yes, the narc did enter a marriage willingly either out of convenience or out of the prestige of being married or because he wanted to be seen publicly as a family man. But make no mistake about it, that narc never had any real intentions to honor that marriage and that is borne out by how the narc used and abused their marriage status and extracted a maximum amount of selfish benefit from it. Did the narc think they were serious right before and for the few months after the marriage? Yes, the narc probably was excited about experiencing what it would feel like to be married, but that hardly qualifies as making a serious commitment, the type of commitment pledged at the wedding ceremony. As the saying goes, by their fruits you shall know them, and a person who uses a marriage vow to engage in debauchery has shown their fruit. Yes, you can call these covert narcissists evil, vile, wicked, backbiters, disloyal, without natural affection, false accusers, truce breakers, incontinent and more simply based upon what they actually do, based on their fruits. Of course there are other norms of society that aren't formally agreed to in writing and with today's culture, where noncommittal relationships are the norm, it is open season for the covert narcissist. The narc thrives on innuendo and loves making false promises and rock solid verbal commitments over and over again that will somehow never have been made or are falsely remembered by the target when the narc decides to move on. Then of course the narc can also always go to the standby of not having anything in common with a partner once they have found a new flavor of partner they want to try out. Only in one case will the narc adhere to an agreement, and that is when both the married narc and another married person engage in an illicit affair which is from the outset agreed upon to be surreptitious and of a limited duration. Give a narc an opportunity to cheat with low odds of being found out and they will. But that adherence to an agreement is simply because the narc had no need to lie, 
at least not about wanting to have a long-term relationship. But the narc will lie in any situation a person can imagine and do it easily without any twinge of guilt even when lying is totally unnecessary, so it is totally understandable why they lie and feign love and commitment to get a relationship they want. Yes, it is these new types of relationships where there are no actual, formal contracts in which the narc thrives. A decent person could lay down their boundaries and all of the ground rules before they would ever enter a relationship and the narc will agree to all of those rules just to get what they have to have. Yes, the narc will even adhere to those rules as long as the current relationship meets their immediate needs and nothing better is available. But the underlying theme is very clear. The narc is keenly aware that any relationship that will have high yield for them requires that narcopath to find a partner willing to invest themselves into both the narc and the relationship itself, and the narc therefore fully understands that they need to seem serious, they need to seem committed, they need to both state and appear to be in love with a target. Yes, the narc agrees to the ground rules and understandings of a relationship because they fully comprehend that this is what they need to do to gain the confidence of and then exploit the genuine love and affection and commitment of a target. So it becomes clear that the narc focuses on and relies on those unwritten and sometimes even formal social agreements to fully entrap a partner who enters those social agreements in good faith. Yes, the narc relies on those agreements, without ever having any intention of adhering to those agreements. Yes, the narc takes everything good and ends up defiling it and using it for evil purposes, for their own selfish purposes. Other people's pain and suffering certainly are never taken into account by the narc, unless they can triangulate and feed off of that suffering of a previous partner. Yes, if the former partner is no longer needed, that narc will have no problem whatsoever capitalizing on the vulnerability of that former partner who loved and committed to them. Yes, the narc will call their wickedness, and the damage they do, as well as their new relationship with someone else, all justified. Just to underscore things the level of this incredible wickedness and callous cruelty is incomprehensible and frankly unbelievable to the average person. So that is how it is when a narc is found out by a partner they are in the process of giving the shaft. When the narc knows that someone has seen behind their mask they will fully destroy and show no mercy. Okay well that was the story from the narc's perspective, the narc who does no wrong, the narc who has in actuality had nothing done to them but decided to defend themselves and unleash a reign of terror and total destruction on another human being. Well here is the narc's problem and it is a rather large one, that person they just disoriented and gaslit into near oblivion didn't jump over the bridge or leave this earth just to make the narc's life easier. They survived. They learned what happened to them and they ended up knowing in high detail what the narc did and how they did it. Yes that target is a human being with feelings and emotions, not a lifeless puppet or an appliance that just has someone abuse it and discard it when the damage done makes it useless. Yes, what about that target? Well they do eventually wake up to reality and it is totally understandable why that target might be a bit unhappy with the covert narcissist. In fact the rage and need for vengeance can be overwhelming and this ends up being a major obstacle for the target and a major source of unhappiness. It is at this point where it is important to state that the clear path to getting yourself back is to do your best not to respond in kind or try to get even with the narcopath even if there is a possibility of doing so. Yes a 100 pound female narcopath knows full well what she can get away with when going up against a man, she understands fully how to leverage her apparent physical vulnerability to her advantage. Who wouldn't believe the female narc not to be a victim? So the male targeted by this demon will do himself no favors trying to make his case or trying to get people to see what this beast actually did. It goes without saying that the male target had better remain totally harmless and never even hint at any getting even. A male target that is being victimized is in a no-win situation since even the slightest hint of displeasure by him might be seen as an act of aggression or misconstrued as a threat. Yes, the female narc can use all sorts of proxies, flying monkeys, to threaten as she pleases. This so-called petite and harmless female narc might get savior thugs or the new boyfriend to terrorize a former partner. But that just makes the situation worse, 
both for the male savior thugs and for the female narc. Men don't take kindly to strangers making threats, and when it is man to man all bets are off. The female narc will simply suffer the risk of potential additional exposure, and that in and of itself could be devastating. But then we have the woman that was targeted and their life is no easier than that of the male target. Sadly, even women will turn against another woman if they can be manipulated by a male narcopath. But even aside from any flying monkeys, the female target will rarely ever succeed in making her case and every attempt at getting people to hear the truth will be seen as her lying, being crazy, being delusional, and proving the narcopath male was right for leaving her in the first place. We have to remember that the narc was weaving a false narrative long before the target ever knew that anything was wrong and part of that false narrative was to preemptively portray the soon-to-be-discarded target as unstable. There are no doubt numerous ways a male or female target could get even, but in almost every case this would involve the target being as devious as the narcopath. Yes, revenge can be extracted at times, but then the target forfeits their most important asset, the fact that they were honest players in the relationship and were unjustly accused. Pastor Chuck Smith said it best, you can get revenge on your own or you can step out of the way and let God give a better result. That is a paraphrase. So what happened to the fictional Jennifer? Well, she was left with few options. Her primary concern was the children. Keeping custody of the children. That house would no longer be hers in less than a year. That house, by the way, was a quaint older building that was one of the mainstays of the community. Jen's father helped the new couple with that home. Every ground floor of that house was sanded and refinished by her weakened father, who had been on dialysis for nearly 10 years, so that house contained the spirit and the love of her father in it. He passed away a little over two years after they moved in. Well, Jennifer did the only thing possible in her situation and moved in with mom who lived a few towns away. There was nothing admirable about meeting mom to bail her out and being constrained to a single room with only the barest minimum of her previous possessions. Jennifer went to work for a local hardware store that was hiring and built herself up day by day. She had to keep up appearances for mom and the kids and she did exactly that. For the six months after her husband announced his liberation and the subsequent triangulation with the former husband and his new partner, Jennifer ate only the barest minimum of food to keep up appearances for the children. She listened to no music and watched no television for two years. She took that time to learn about covert narcissism and slowly rebuilt her life. She kept working at the hardware store and put out that resume of hers, now over 10 years old, and for the longest time heard from no one. But two years later her luck changed and she left that hardware store and took the opportunity to work at a local law firm. That secretarial and clerical work is an absolute godsend to Jennifer, a person who before the marriage was on track to becoming a lawyer. She left that hardware store with tears in her eyes. She invested herself into the customers as well as the store itself and tried to make a difference. She left a piece of herself behind in that store, but it was time for her to move on and leave a very painful chapter of her life behind. Was Jennifer angry and resentful? Was she in disbelief day and night that another woman stole from her her entire existence? Yes, of course, she was. Was she hoping to hear that a major tragedy had befallen her husband and or his new partner? Yes, she would have obtained so much relief knowing that karma had settled the score. But that didn't happen. Her husband was doing well financially and in fact decided to tear down that lovely old house and build a new McMansion in its place. Then the shocker of all but it did give Jennifer some relief, one year after just having bulldozed and rebuilt, her husband now decided he was relocating himself and his business to California. Yes, that was Jennifer and her husband's dream, to move somewhere warm and yes, Someone else would be living Jennifer's dream, but the upside was that she would no longer have to deal with the presence of these freaks in her life. The children could visit dad, but those weekly visitations would be a thing of the past. Yes, make no mistake about it, 
Jennifer had truly loved that husband of hers, and the thought of another woman having taken what was rightfully hers could have destroyed her if she didn't focus on learning very precisely about covert narcissism and knowing that she wasn't alone in the world. Yes, every meal that new couple shared, every vacation, every walk on the beach, every kiss, and every hug, every text message that rightfully belonged to her, was stolen from her. But slowly the Jennifer understood about covert narcissism. Yes, you can read all about covert narcissism and get a good idea of what it is all about, but to actually understand the implications of it and to actually somehow make sense of the twisted logic and motivations of a covert narcissist takes many years of study. So in the end Jennifer understood that she lost nothing when that creep left her high and dry. In the end Jennifer realized that she lost nothing when that so-called husband of hers left except for the investment that she made in that man and the home she made for him. She still had her children and after much work got back herself and her self-esteem, as well as her self-confidence. Yes, Jennifer was in a financial hole, but she had already dug herself partly out of that hole and had a clear path forward for being totally out of debt. Yes, in the end, it was all about the children and they were doing well. It would be another 10 years, at least, of focusing on the children. But she had found herself again. She was alive. She had hope for the future. And more important than anything else, she had overcome the resentment. Yes, the Bible told her what God said about getting even, vengeance is mine, I will repay saith the Lord, and she left that narc and his new partner in God's hands. That meant it wasn't her responsibility to warn anyone about the narcopath or her responsibility to stop them from hurting others. God would take care of the situation and God would repay. If God chose to keep Jennifer in one room and without any partner for 15 years while her ex-husband and his new partner were living in luxury in a warm environment so be it. God is God, he makes the rules and it isn't for us to try to criticize the outcomes God allows. In the end the Bible gave Jennifer the most important key to overcoming the resentment and that was the parable of the unforgiving servant found in Matthew 18 verses 23 to 35. That passage clearly shows that the vengeance that we are seeking, the need to see a person who wronged us pay is literally the same as someone owing us something, owing us a debt. Make no mistake, those treacherous narcopaths who, for no other reason than pure malevolent selfishness, decided to destroy another person who never meant anything but good for them, owe those targets an incalculable amount. An amount that after many years have passed and the damage was done and then repaired can never be repaid. Yes, that narc could give Jennifer $1 million and it wouldn't be enough. 10 million wouldn't do it. No amount of money can repair the damage the narc has done. But that verse in Matthew clearly shows us the bigger picture. None of us is innocent and if God is willing to forgive us of our sins, otherwise known as our debt to him, which we can never repay, then we are required to forgive the debt others owe us, especially if they can't repay. If we aren't willing to forgive the narc's debt, we face a real possibility of having to pay our own debt to God as well. Yes, the covert narcissist is all in with the above explanation that emphasizes that the target must let go of their grievances. Any given narcopath will very much like the concept of never being able to pay the target back. The narc is very comfortable thinking to themselves, yes I can't pay, they need to go on with their lives and let me live my own life. That target needs to let me off of the hook. That target needs to get over it. That target needs to move on. Yes the narc is correct. They are off the hook. With the last target, in this case Jennifer. But otherwise, that narc is as wrong as can be. The narc has no right to ever tell another person, especially the target whose life they destroyed, how they should be handling that abuse. More importantly, the narc hasn't looked at the grand scheme of things. They don't have to deal with the previous targets, yes, Jennifer wasn't her husband's only victim, there were more before, and they may press their luck and get away with victimizing a few more people. But eventually the narc's luck will run out. 
Know that Narc may never face their targets, but they will need to give an account of their lives to God one day. Yes, that narc can live in luxury and in the nicest environment imaginable, but they will one day have to pay for what they have done. Yes, if they have a conversion and accept Jesus, maybe they will receive eternal life, but even that won't be the end of the problem for the narcopath. Yes, we are assuming the narc has a genuine conversion. There are three possibilities of what occurs in the afterlife for a narcissist as far as the author can tell. One. There may simply be total annihilation, with the narc simply ceasing to exist and never understanding that they lost out on eternal life in a far superior environment than our present earth in a far superior body than our present bodies. 2. They will be in eternal torment. 3. They will make it to the new earth to come, but live a very compromised life. Yes, that narc may spend eternity living in a shack with the barest minimum of marginally palatable food and sweeping the streets for the whole of that eternity, while others live in mansions doing important, stimulating, and interesting work that produces true fulfillment and a sense of accomplishment. Yes, maybe one day that narc will be put on trial to account for their lives, and the jury will consist of all of the people that they targeted over the course of their lives. No, those highly visible charities and causes that NARC made sure everyone knew they were involved in won't make much if any difference. Only truth will be used to judge that narcopath and decide their fate and the NARC will be fully aware they have no possibility of weaseling their way out of, or lying their way out of, or gaslighting themselves out of a just judgment. That NARC will be fully aware that their wicked actions, all of their lies, all of their betrayal, all of their disloyalty, all of their treachery, all of their infidelity will be illuminated and no amount of projection, blaming others for what they themselves are guilty of, will make any difference at all. The narc made an active decision to be wicked, to lie, to be evil. They seared and eliminated whatever conscience they were born with. They hurt many people and never cared. They were told about Jesus and thought it all a joke or took the attitude that they heard all of it before. Okay. Well after a while a person becomes a reprobate. The narc didn't want the truth, they didn't believe in or want Jesus. Well eventually Jesus won't want them. The narc wants to go it alone and believes they have done no wrong. Okay then. They have been clearly warned numerous times in numerous ways that they are in grave danger from possibly the only person who ever cared about them. No one knows what will really happen after we die, but the above scenarios are based on different people's interpretations of what the Bible has to say. Lest someone say, well that's the Bible's take on it, remember this one very important fact, Jesus was God and demonstrated without a doubt that he had power over life and death. Therefore he has the authority to tell us in his word what we might expect. Yes, the humans interpreting the word may be incorrect, but one of those three possibilities as described above is our best guess as to what to expect when we meet our maker. If Jesus as God endorsed the Bible, then we might want to take it seriously. So what does the covert narcissist owe the target? Nothing. Paid in full. That is how Jennifer found peace in her life despite the incredible burden of seeing the perpetrator, the wicked, prosper after having caused so much pain and destruction. Her ex-husband owes her nothing. Paid in full. Her reward. Peace of mind, joy, hope, a renewed faith in people while at the same time taking into full account that evil people exist in this world. Let those narcopaths have their wealth their success, and let them enjoy their lives even though we know these people will never be happy or satisfied in any situation they ever find themselves in. But don't forget that the possibility of the narcs suffering for their misdeeds and ending up in a far worse situation, in shabby surroundings either alone or with a partner and future that makes them want to crawl out of their skin, and with no way out for that narc, also becomes the ultimate destination for many of these creeps. The target, however isn't really interested what becomes of the narc in this life, they have a firm assurance that one day true justice will be served and the narc will receive the rewards they have earned in this world. Yes at minimum two witnesses will be required and for many narcs there will be far more than two to verify the nature of that narc's 
character. Thank you for watching. Comments are welcomed. Peace be with you.